So let us start with the problems that I have given in this topic. I, I may have, <clears throat> I may be missing some problems, but these are problems I have right now. Okay. So again, just give me one second. I have to tell Chandan also the same thing to join here. Uh, hi Chandan, just join in this link I have sent for today. Hi. Okay, so here is problem number one. This is a problem number one. And what is the question? Okay, so F is a so f is a linear function. F is a linear function from R2 to R2. Is it visible? Is the writing okay? Hello? Okay, thank you. So f is a linear function from R2 to R2, linear. So we know the definition of this, that is f of, so let's say t is some scalar, then and we, V1 is a vector, or you can take a pair of numbers, or you can call it a pair of numbers. This is so basically scalar can come out and uh, the addition splits okay, like this. Okay. So it is linear. Okay. What you want to show now, we are putting it in this language, but you know, in your tests and such, they can put it in terms of matrices also. This matrix defines this function, then show that. You know, this is such and such happens. Now, what we have to prove that if F is injective, there is another problem with this that part of this is very old laptop, or part of it is not. If F is injective, then F is subjective. It's a pretty cool problem if you think about it. If L is injected, then it's subjective also. It, it, does everybody remember the definition of linear? I have written it, but even then. Example would be like matrices, two by two matrices, because they take input a pair of numbers and it's very difficult to write on this because yeah, if you take a if you take a yeah, uh, because the two by two matrix will take input a pair of numbers and you give output a pair of numbers. We have seen that. Let's see something else. And in fact, matrices are the only examples. So it's basically a question about matrices. But how do you exactly transform translate it? We have to see.
can approach this problem either way. You can consider f as a matrix and do, or you can directly do it like a functional functional equation, just like a function itself. You can do it. Everybody is joining late today. Adish has sent a link here in the chat. Use that link for today. Okay. Okay. Only for today, it will be conducted on that thing. So you can leave this one. This is, I'm just okay. it kept it open for you. <laughs> Okay, come on, anyone has ideas? Did you guys didn't try it? Because it's a fun question, right? It's a, not such a boring question, maybe. So no one has any ideas. Let me let's try to do it in terms of matrices, okay? Because you guys will be more comfortable with that, right? So let's try to click, and we know that every linear function, for every linear function f, there is a matrix, right? There is a square matrix, uh, a, b, c, d, whatever, such that. When you input this vector, this is a tuple, so the output is the same as for the functions. So the function for every such function, there is a matrix. This so I just forgive me today, the writing will be bad because this is a different machine. Yeah. So if A, if A which is this two by two matrix. A is this two by two matrix. And if this is, if this defines an injective function, then what does that mean? And what does that mean? That implies, and you guys can check this, that a times v is never zero. Right? For any v. Yeah. A times v is not zero if v, I mean v itself, which is so by v, obviously, you should understand. And we have used this notation before. V one, V two is not zero. Means if no, at least one of them is not zero. You see, it means that a non-zero vector, when it inputs a non-zero vector, the output is also a non-zero vector. Now you want to show that this matrix can give any output. Yeah. Now we want to show surjectivity that translates in our more familiar things. We don't want to show that for any 
W, this is a vector. That maybe I can put this condition. There exists a V such that A V is equal to W. It's not a very good way to do this problem, but I suppose this is a more comfortable way to do. That's what subjectivity means by definition, right? You want to show that the output fills up the entire space. So maybe you can also you can also see the picture here. So this is your E1, which is, you know, it is one comma zero, and is E2. Okay, so here is a very concrete question, and this is a very simple question. Where does E1 go? Can anybody tell? What's the output of E1? You should be able to tell without any calculations, but you can do the calculation and tell. So where does the, this unit vector one comma zero where does this go via this function via this a or f whatever this has nothing to do with injectivity let's just look at the matrix and you can tell where does one comma zero go oh, yeah right the comma c so it just goes to a comma c Again, this is uh, I'm just having trouble drawing here because it's very different. A comma C. Good. And so similarly, this goes to D comma D. Now, if you want to show that F is subjective, then does that mean? See, if a comma c is in the image, maybe I I can say that properly. A times e one is uh, a c, and a times e two is is this. So these two things you have already found in the image these two vectors. Now, if these two things are in the image, it means that all linear combinations of these are also in the image, right? Yeah, that implies that, you know, you can take any, any linear combination, lambda times this, lambda one times this maybe, lambda two times this, these are all in the image and they, they will obviously come from, you, can, you know where they will come from. Right. So this is a feature of linear function. When any two things are in the image, then the whole kind of you know everything that you can get from those two by adding and multiplying the scalars, they will be there. It's called the linear span, but we don't need to know that. That works. Okay. Now can you say? Why F is subjective? How do you use the injectivity? You already have 
something something here that you can So what what should we say about KC and BD if we want to say that everything will be in the image? The image is whole R2. What should AC and BD satisfy? First coordinate and second coordinate, yeah. But how do you say that it's possible? What should be satisfied by a CMB? Okay, let's let's listen to Adish. Adish, you were saying. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. R2 to R2. So this amounts from R2 to R2. Okay. Injected. Yes, yes, completely. I see injective no injective functions are defined for functions in between sets to sets. Right? You have done that. Yes. So yeah, analogous. I mean, basically any two inputs, any two different inputs go to two different outputs. Right? But I have put a special implication on that here. When not special, but for us, it may look special that not, no non zero thing goes to zero. Right? Because this is the image of zero. Yes, yes, right. Because zero, there is only see, zero, there is only one zero. There should always be one zero, which is zero, which is zero, comma zero, right? Everything else is non zero. Yes, everything is natural. Okay. Right. And then we want to see that if it is injective, then it's also subjective. Okay. But maybe linear functions, they are not very comfortable. So we'll use matrices because we know that every linear function, there is a matrix for it. Okay. So we'll be using matrices. And maybe in your exam, they just, I mean, they just do it, give it, give it to you for matrix, maybe the T by T matrix. Clean if you use just functions, then it's much cleaner, but it's much more maybe difficult to one because abstract. So, I'm saying in terms of matrices, we have a matrix A which is corresponding to that function and that is injected. Then we are exploring where does the image of E1 and E2 go, and we are saying okay, they go to AC and BD, that's just from the matrix. So now we want to use that. If these two are the image, then every other image is in terms of them. In terms of them. And so what should the condition be on AC and BD so that the image fills up the entire space? Everything in the image is a combination of these two linear combination of these two vectors. And yes. Yes, right. And you can simply say that these two are linearly independent. They're geometrical. Similar arguments like so. okay, okay, right, right. So in this case, in this case, you're basically we want to say that AC and BD are in different directions, which is the same as saying that the corresponding determinant is non-zero, but that's a magic. Right, which we don't yet maybe understand very well. But yeah, you can obviously use it. 
but simply we want AZ and BD to be in different directions. Is that right? So our task is now to show, to show, so we are, we have reduced our question, right? We want to show that AC, maybe I'll write this, and BD, or maybe I'll just say like this, AC is not equal to C and A, AC, I want to show that AC is not equal to some A times BD. That's it, right? Because if because we want them to be in different directions, if they are in different directions, then obviously their linear combinations will fill up the entire plane. And you can just basically take any point. You know how to get there, right? You can just it just extend this line suitably and extend this suitably. And you know the parallelogram will take the addition will take you there. Which means you multiply this by a suitable lambda and this by another suitable thing, and you get there. It's very obvious from the picture. But also, you know it as a theorem, determinant term zero, invertible. But much easier to see this and much more useful for us. So now, can you show that? That, and this is actually true. So how we will show you use contradiction that if they are, then, so think, clean up a few things. So F is injective. We want to show that these two vectors, these two AC and B, which are the images of these two uh, canonical independent vectors, E1 and E2. We want to show that the images are also independent, not orthogonal, but independent. I can't do it in this So I just erase it. So it's not very difficult, right? So we assume, so assume that, yes, we have, we have to do it by contradiction, right? So we assume that AC is equal to A times BD. Yes, so uh, let me just write the rest of the thing here. I don't want to erase because it suddenly will not be, and I'm not able to move things in this laptop. So, so if, AC, if AC is equal to KBD, then what do we get? Then we get that A times E1 is equal to A times A E2, right? So that's what AC is. And then again, we use the linearity. So this is essential. So only knowing the only knowing matrices as, as tables and so on, you know, is not going to help you solve this problem. Right. So you have to know it as that linear, linear, linear function. Basically, you have to use this linear property and that you can do this. So we then get that then this is zero. And that is a contradiction, right? Because E1, because this is certainly not zero, right? Because uh, what is this? E1 minus K, what is this? So this is one minus K. Even if K is zero, it is not zero. So then we are getting that a non-zero thing is going to zero, which obviously cannot happen for an injective function because zero, the zero output is this zero obviously means this zero like this. Okay. This is obviously the output of something else.
to see if there are any questions because the other questions are because we'll just do maybe two more and the rest you can now do it do them in a similar way there are much better ways to do it but uh, for that we'll need better language which we don't have the time for. so maybe this looks a little bit tricky but it's not So then are there any questions? Is it clear? Okay. Okay. So see, basically the, the main thing that is happening here, which you can also, the main idea which you can hold on to and extend it to, to higher, and there is certainly three by three matrices are not out of scope, right? That can be even. The key thing here is that then you look at vectors which are in different directions like this e1 and e2 and if in three dimensions then there are three different vectors which are not coplanar that is a corresponding thing right and they will generate the whole space basically any three vectors or so in this case any two vectors which are independent which are not in the same direction their image will always be independent any two vectors which are independent their image will also be independent. You see, that is the main thing. Independent means that they are in different directions. Right. So the key, right, in different directions. And that in, um, in 3D means that they are not planar. Right? Basically, independent vectors means that they, each of them has a, new, has a different contribution. Right. So let's say V1, V2, V3 in R3, right, is independent. Well, there is a definition I can give, but yes, right. And that will precisely happen when each of these three vectors has a different, con has a new contribution. Means that V3 cannot be gotten from V1 and V2. And V2 cannot be gotten from V1 and V3 and so on. Okay, yeah. So let me just, yeah. So let, three orthogonal vectors, right? Or any three vectors which are not coplanar in three dimensions. Or in two dimensions, in fact, they're just not in different directions, they are just in different directions. Okay, so let me let me just make the definition of this independent because this I think is a good you seems to be an important thing. It can be confusing if I don't define it. So so v1, v2, v3. In R2, it is very obvious, so I'm not saying anything, but in R3, it may be confusing. Okay. R independent. Are said to be independent if uh, it basically you cannot kill them if you, you cannot kill them by taking linear combination with that. If if t1 times v1 and then you scale the second one by t2 and scale the third one by t3 and you add them and this if this becomes zero basically it can never become zero so if it becomes zero then that implies that t1 is zero and T2 is zero and T3 is zero. So maybe you cannot immediately see why the, how this is related to generating everything, but just take this as this definition first, okay? The three, these three vectors, and these are column vectors. Okay. Now these, these are actually in disguise, these are all questions in linear equations in three variables, but I'm not putting it like that now, okay? In fact, we will use this to later on do the theory of linear equations in three variables, three equations. Okay. Because that theory is usually done with the Kramer rule and so on, which is not very clear as to what the solutions are and what kind of solutions. Is. There's always some sort of confusion. So we'll clarify that with this theory. But 
this is the first definition okay that is three vectors are said to be independent but in general in r n dimension but here if physically there is no linear combination which can make them zero other than obviously the trivial one okay now you see this is this is this is exactly the thing it's exactly the same as saying that they are non non coplanar right if we take uh, vectors in different directions you see if they are in if they are not coplanar if, if all three are not in a plane then you cannot make them zero right because any linear so because if you take this as v1 and you take this as so i'm trying to say that this definition is the same as saying that they are non coplanar and then you can see that it is the same as saying that they can be used to generate everything you know by taking combination so all, all of them are the same concept yeah this is in no obviously can anybody argue that uh, these three if they, they are non coplanar then they are independent so i want argument for non coplanar implies just an argument remove the proof i lost the proof also for homework after say a little bit more Yes, yes, but then it becomes a question. Then basically, you'll end up transforming it as a question in linear equations. You have three linear equations, and the rows are kind of the determinant is non-zero, and so there will be a unique solution, and zero is the only solution, something like that. But you see, I'm trying to say the geometry that you can see. But the point is that if you take so these three vectors are non-coplanar. Point is that if you extend if you extend this line v1 to t v1 in that direction. And if extend this to rather a t one v one and t two v two, okay. Now, if you add them, what will you get? You will make it. You get some huge vector or a small vector, but it will be in the same plane, right? These will be in the same plane. So this thing. Yes, I mean, yeah. Like when you the first two, you can never get the third. Yes, yeah. Rotation, yeah. Just by simple uh, in addition, we we cannot get certainly that because this is what. So this green thing is what you will get as you know when you try to add the first two. Let's see. But then, can that ever be equal to t three v three or minus t three v three? It's just impossible, right? Because I mean, <laughs> because it's not in this line. It's not in this. This thing is in that plane, but v three is not in that plane. So there's no way. Right? There's no way that this 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 can this can never be equal to t three v three. It is just no way. Okay, this is a this is not a proof. This is not a proof. This cannot be accepted. Will not be accepted as a proof. Okay, uh, but this is just a thing. because yeah, because non-coplanar self is not such a. Yeah, can you make that trivial? Is what is non-coplanar? What does non-coplanar mean? Right, so. So I'm so let's not let me not give this as a problem, but just keep it like this. Okay. But what I want to ask, which can be given as because non-coplanar it cannot really be defined very well. I think it maybe becomes a little difficult. But what I can ask is now if and this you have to do for homework to do this. You can use all the theory of determinants and all even if you don't know the proofs because you know. And this will be immensely useful when we also do cubic equations and those things in detail. Okay, so either way, try it. 
So when you have um, these three vectors, if these are independent, sorry, independent, then um, then R three is equal to. I'm just writing it in a rather bad way, but. Basically, it is if C one, C two, C three are in this. So this you have to prove. You can so you can give an argument also. You can give an. You should give an argument. You should give the argument to yourself also. With before you do the proof that you can get any vector, but I want to prove also. Both is needed. Okay, proof is definitely needed. You can get any vector. Now this is just a question. Linear equations try to write things, notations, and just. And then the next question is, then uh, do problem one. For do problem one for f r three to r three. Obviously, again you can use matrices. I'm not going into the good proofs of good uh, way to do these things because this is fine for us. So just see, just try to summarize it in your head. If you just take a minute, review it, what you have learned here. So this is fine. Right. Note these two questions now. Try them. Now the next question is actually simple, so we can. Okay, and also just wanted to say a few things here. This uh, okay. Let me maybe I can just. So what we have what we have shown is f is uh, injective. implies f, f is subjected. Also, as a homework, you can try to show the converse. It's not difficult, it's just simple. Same kind of thing. Okay. So when you have a linear function from R2 to R2 or R3 to R3 or whatever, okay. Injectivity and subjectivity are the same notions. Okay. This is what we have to do. Now, this is I want to highlight. Now, this is just saying this is analogous to a uh, map between finite sets of sorry. <laughs> Same, same size. Do you guys agree? If you have two finite sets of same size, then injectivity implies subjectivity, and subjectivity implies injectivity. Okay. So R three is obviously not finite, but 
but linear functions but say r3 is not finite but there are finitely many things which generate r3 right you take any three things if they are independent if they are not in the same plane that they generate r3 so r3 is not finite but it has a finiteness notion right if you allow for this generation thing then it's finite and linear functions kind of if you can get those three things, then you can get everything in general. Okay. So linear functions are, are though they are objectively mapped between infinite spaces, okay, they can actually be understood completely by what they do and three independent set vectors. Okay. So that is the upshot. That linear functions, linear functions can, can be completely understood. And basically, this is what we have used in the proof earlier. And everything about them, all the images actually point by point can be determined. I can just say not understood, I can just say determined. Understood maybe is the wrong word, yeah. Can be completely determined from to say very concretely, and this is the key. This is the key. All so we have used this F E1, the matrix on E1, right? We had seen an E2. That was that was it. That showed us that everything has either in there is a combination of that. Every other image is a combination of these two, but here it will be these three. It's completely understood by these three things and the image of these three things basically and even it within their image so it is essentially a map between those two sets right and this uh, you see that's the thing that is all that that's okay. and this this phenomenon this we used earlier but we also use this to make matrices how did we make a matrix we just said that if you know the value of these things and other things you can figure out right f of any v if uh, if v is maybe v one v one or maybe this is not such a good notation so v one v one this is also yeah but this notation is used so it's fine this then you see what it is is basically f e one uh so I mean just writing it like this f e2 this is basically what we are used to make the matrix that was also highlighting the same thing the linear functions are actually understood by their action by what they do on some finite this is not like continuous functions continuous functions are understood by what they do on a dense set right a set whose you know whose limits give you everything else continuous functions are understood by that only Okay, so you, you, would, you guys would know that, right? So any point you want, if you want the image of a point, if you know a sequence of points whose image we know, and if it converts to that special point, then you know the value of that point also. So continuous functions are understood on that, which means rationals. If, they, if you know them on rationals, then you know them on, on the reals, right? So they are, they, for them, you need a countable set to understand that. It, okay. Linear functions are much more special, okay, in that sense. So it is it is basically like this and this this is also a column this is also you know columns and depth is going in the matrix so that is what i wanted to point so are there any questions here this way you can also get the three by three matrix because if a linear function is given to you and want to solve a problem for that you know that there is an underlying matrix and you can, but not just knowing it, you can also simply know what that matrix is. Right? Because you, because if you know Fe1, now if Fe1 is like A, B, C, and this is like Fe2 is like B, B, F, and Fe3 is like G, H, whatever, you know, I, then that's it. That's all you need. Right? 
this will be the image what you get that's the image that's f of b yeah and this matrix will remain the same every other thing you just put in these three coordinates and you So then let's go to the next thing. Yeah, so that was saying the next question is actually very simple but very crucial. In fact, this should have been the first question. So if F, now we can put anything, doesn't matter. Because yeah, let's if F is a function from R3 to R3 and uh, V not equal to zero implies fv not equal to zero so we only know that zero does not go to zero sorry non-zero things don't go to zero that's all we know we know that non-zero things don't go to zero then we want to show show that f is injective or subjective same thing in this case F is injective. Obviously, injectivity implies that. That's trivial. We have used that also. This time we can maybe do it via the function approach. But yeah, you, you can do it in this case. So you can again try to do this by contradiction or either way so you can. Charge this. this there is a problem. If, if it gets disconnected, then just hold on. Do this for R2 also, R2 to R2. Doesn't really make a difference. Yeah. 
Yes, obviously. Otherwise, it's obviously not true. You can just make a bit. Yeah, I've not written it. Assume it's not injective, and then uh, like this, doing it should not be difficult. Understanding it, you will understand its importance over time, but doing it, it just doing the problem should not be difficult. You can try anything. I mean, it's a new topic, so it's fine. How do you do it for R2? A minus B. What is what is A in the matrix? Okay, okay. okay. So so this is A B C D. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, actually, that can be zero. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, or that one, yeah. So that's okay. I mean, uh, we may not be able to do A by B, so yeah, because B may be. Z. No, but uh, B may be zero, but okay, assume it's not zero, otherwise you can make that special case and so on. So this is not equal to, okay, then, mm -hmm. okay, okay. Okay. Okay, how? Okay, so purely, yeah, we do the calculations, yeah. Okay. So we want okay, and then you do some ah okay 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 not that. right okay I get it. So just if you just do from here, you will get that a by b is minus one because uh, or something. No, yeah. yeah. Oh yes yes right right right, which is a contradiction right? But let's write that because. It's it's roughly the right solution. You get uh, yeah minus 
v2 minus v2 minus v2 right so then this is what we are getting is what we are not supposed to get we already said that we are not supposed to get this but as you can see this is a fairly i mean it's non enlightening it does the problem but it doesn't tell you for us but yeah then if you take the other case and you can do it similar okay but you see you can just use the linearity right since you have written down the matrices see from here you can use linearity right that's what we are not using basically what does injectivity mean injectivity means that f of u is not equal to f of v but you can use the translation linearity means along the translation so you can translate and you can look at v minus u and that will go to zero right and that's all you need to know so if two things go to the same thing then there is something that goes to zero which is the difference because you can take the difference these are not sets these are not just sets right these are more and you see it doesn't really matter if it's three dimensions or four dimensions you can do the same thing it's a very simple fact but this is the key to get one started in the theory which we are not going to do but this is a, just a very good simple problem and it's uses just uses the fact that there is a minus that you can do there is a minus that's what we are doing because this is also used when there is a in here in uh, this binary operations chapter also. function so on so on but we'll not do that now yeah so basically you see if 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 f of f of u is equal to f of v it's just this one line yeah then uh, that implies f of u minus this simple just the, but the fact that there is a we are able to do a subtraction we don't have division in r3 and so on but we have a subtraction that's all we are used so injectively implies that nothing no non zero goes to zero but no non zero goes to zero is all we need to know say that it is injective Okay. this is very crucial because now the set of things that go to zero will be the set of solutions to linear equations you know when you have ax x equal to zero solutions to that so we will have to see so those things we can understand by these corresponding functions that function is injective there will be an arterial solution and so on and so on so we'll see that later so are there any questions in here in yes. Okay, so then I suppose it's fine. Yeah, so let's just do one last question. I did start late today, but I will not be able to go late today. So I have some other thing. Do you want friend as an exam? Yeah. He has one, not from one homework, he has a question. So I don't know if I can do it because I tried it. Yeah, let's do this. This is a, a very important question. Find the matrix for reflection because it's important that you be able to you know make the make things make the actual matrices for this naturalizing linear functions right so matrix is matrix for reflection matrix for rotation we sort of already saw okay, but matrix for reflection and we also had seen that when the rotation is linear and so on I also wanted to say the area in bilinearity of area. I will say that maybe I was think I thought I'll say that because that will be a good uh, on the border of both area things, integration area, and also this uh, linear bilinear thing. Okay. We'll see. So matrix for reflection. So reflection. So maybe we can just say S. R not R S is usually used for reflection. R is not used. So if we are using this reflection R to R to, then the this is a very simple computational question. What is 
what does this function look like as a matrix? What does the matrix look like? I'm not saying more details now, I just want to like think that it is good. S is a reflection. So S is, this is also very useful in study of matrix powers. Suddenly powers of a matrix become identity. Sometimes powers of matrix become zero. So you will see. Um, yeah, so yeah, obviously, yes, yeah. so I should say that that's not correct. Um, I, we could do this in reflection. Let's do this in general, yeah? Reflection about the line L. I mean, obviously, let's take L. L has to pass through the origin. Otherwise, it will not be a linear function. So first of all, let me mention this thing. First of all, is S linear? S linear. And the answer is yes and no. So we'll have to see, right? So if you take a line, oh, but now the battery is low, but if I plug the charger in the Wi-Fi for a second, <coughs> I might get cut off. Second. Usually I plug it before, but since it's not my actual. So let's just do this properly. So here we have this line, line L. You can uh, you can say that it's direction there is maybe L one cross L two, but that's not a very good notation. So V one comma V two is so this is uh, how do you say that? No, so this is not good. Let's say uh, one comma. Let's say that the point one comma v two is on this line. So I can write with this. So we have one comma v two is on this line. And that's all you need to know to know this line. It passes with the origin. Now, certainly this is a linear function. Can we check that, that it's a linear function? Certainly, you can do that. So you can also see it directly. You can also see it very directly. So you can just take this vector and you can take another vector. Right, and you can try to reflect them, and then you can reflect that sum. You will see you get the same thing. So you first reflect them and take the sum, and you know use some congruence or similarity or something to show that get the same thing. But just you can check it. So I'm not doing it. Okay. So I check that S is, it's not, but it's a very you get a very nice proof, very elegant looking thing. Interesting proof. We actually do it like this. Okay. It's a good practice because trust me, this uh, this is only for reflection and this rotation. But when you have other things, you may come across um, like area how that splits. 
area formed by the parallelogram v1 comma v2 or area area formed by parallelogram with you know the two vectors v1 and v2 how is that related to the area formed by parallelogram of two vectors let's say v1 and v2 plus v3 and then v1 v3 so so on you know some vectors collection of vectors and how does how does area behave with respect to addition of vectors the area of the corresponding parallel that's also it's a good thing to check it because the computation of the area you can check it so check that okay so check uh, geometric okay maybe uh, next time some of you one of you will maybe be presented geometrically okay but also note that you will need the fact that l passes with the origin so you see you will certainly need that right because you see that that is very clear because l does not pass to the origin uh because if I see if L does not pass to the origin, the zero gets mapped to something else, right? But zero has to go to zero under a linear function. You can check that. Yes, because the vectors are to zero, so so the line has to be so. So basically, you can take any line L that is passing to the origin, and now we have this reflection function. And we want to understand its matrix. So, so these things we can check. The more you spend time, but it is. How do we figure out the matrix? Uh, it's, it's very simple because we have seen right that if you if you take a vector and you want to know because now we know that it is linear see just knowing that something is linear and so many things are linear just knowing that something is linear makes the problem very simple that's what it is about that's what this whole thing is about okay and that's why when something is not linear we try to understand it in terms of linear things like derivatives right? we try to understand it through this line is a thing, but that line is the roughly the linear thing over the function. The linear things we actually truly understand. We understand if you take a linear line, we understand what are all the points on it. We can completely describe them. If you ask, you know, uh, everything, right? Even if you ask what are the integer points on that line, we have a basically that corresponds to a for b by equal to c, and you can find all the integer solutions, or you can say there is no solution. You know, this theorem, uh, lemma kind of thing. So you basically linear functions are completely understood. But when you take a quadratic and you ask for the integer solutions, it's not so simple, right? So and then for cubic and so on, it kind of becomes extremely hard. So linear functions is what we actually understand. Number theoretically, geometrically, topologically, we understand. Right? That's why we try to understand other things in terms of linear things. So. That's what it is about. And so S B and um, now if P is equal to so you can take lambda one e one. Now this is a good thing. We know that this is what they are about. Then, uh, but we'll actually do the calculations because uh, so it's, this is a repetition of what I said earlier. So just you guys can quickly tell me what is S E one and S E two. If uh, you know if L is if L is having that or better in the more in more notation, L is I mean L is y equal to mx. Let's just find L. So if I take so you guys know so it's clear, right? Once you know SE1 and SE2, you have done. So what is SE1? Where will that go into effect and do your calculations? Um so this is y equal to mx and you can quickly tell me where e1 goes.
no so we want to yeah and there's another thing so you guys can do the calculation and tell me now there is this thing maybe yeah it's why it's fine you want to solve this mm. Is it difficult? So we can multiply this. X is no, X is not on that line. No, I was, yeah, so whatever. So, what's the final thing? What's X and Y in terms of N? One minus X, and okay, so I'm doing it here then. Solving it. One plus M square. One minus M square. That is the X. Come on, nobody did it. What did that mean? <laughs> right, this is what we get. If what you also get, okay, then it's good because uh, I calculations can go wrong. So, okay, so this is SE1 and for SE2, also, uh, I don't know, you can tell me. So you see, this is this is the x coordinate, and this is yeah, because you have taken a general n, so that's why it is happening like this. And so then, where is zero comma uh, one go? Will it be the opposite or something like that? Opposite and some negative, right? Yeah, just do the calculation and waiting. Okay, then do it for homework. <laughs> okay, then find this. This is very simple. Okay, when when you basically basically the point is that when you actually find it, that will be the matrix. So when you put in any, once you do that work for these two things, this is the idea which we don't use. That's because it's this is a new idea which we really don't use on when we do reflection section. We find the, what some lines and they reflect each other. We don't really use this. But this can be a very good idea because this is the fundamental nature of reflection. And this calculations, I mean, the fact that you're getting such a good matrix tells us that this is the right notion. And so that. Yeah, to find reflection point, that's right. Yeah. But then, yeah, we, but we never use the fact that reflection is like this. Even when we have several lines, we use some other properties, but we never use this that it's a linear function. Okay, and that is the good thing. But then you can check that whatever matrix you get, please check it that a square will be equal to identity. Is that a surprise? Sure. 
So the raised square is identical. Without actually finding, can you say? See S here, when you take S, S composed with S is identity. That's what reflection is. That's the meaning of reflection, right? I mean, yeah, so how? Yeah, that's what reflection is. And so you can then check that this implies this. Now that's very simple, right? Because well, S here is S, and then oh, so here is S, and then you know that this when you put in a vector, okay, then so or maybe I can just say it like this simply. So basically, this matrix multiplication here corresponds to the composition, but exactly how we can see. So S, so we know that. S V is equal to A V. Okay. Now A V is an output and S is also an output. So these are like in vectors on which you can apply S. When you apply S on this, basically it means that you can apply A on this. Right. But that basically means that this is A square V. I mean, A square you can multiply and then apply functions of the social Function composition is associated by you. We are not using the fact that matrix multiplication is actually not not that we don't even have two matrices. So basically, that's what we get, right? That S square B is S square B, but then S square B is V. So A square B is V. But if A square B is V for every V, you can show that A square is identity. Why? Because again, linear functions are determined by three points. Something happens for three points, they match, and they match for everything. Right? So, again, this is a question for you guys. This is just straightforward. If uh, F1, F2, sorry, because this is part of the screen which I cannot see. Problem in screen. If F1 and F2 uh, are linear, the second follows the same principle, but then you can just see it here directly by doing the calculations and so on, right? Be good. Are linear, I wrote linear twice. So they're just linear, not linear, linear. It's linear. Then uh, if F of if F1V is equal to F2V. And F1 W is equal to F2 W and three if F1 U is equal to F2 U, then this is a question. Does it imply that F1 equals to F2? So you see the answer is certainly will be yes. You can kind of smell that, that when V and W are in, when V and W when V W and U are independent, right? when they are like they are the unit vectors, the orthogonal unit vector. Then when we know the values on these two, then we obviously know the entire function because that's how we make the matrix, right? So try to see again. This is simple. You can take the difference of the functions and do and so on. You have to think. So basically, we are going to use that here that if this behaves like identity, and it is the identity. Okay, so a lot of times when you look at a matrix and you want to prove something about it, if you can see what function it represents geometrically, then you can use a geometry. Sometimes if it is given to you like a to the power of 10 is equal to identity, and very often it is rotation by 2 pi by 10. And that's why it's becoming like this. Or it may be by 2 pi by 5 also. But I mean, that will also give you identity after 5 rotations and hence after 10 rotations. 10 uh, times multiplication. But so you see, we this basically we have, we, we have given a meaning to matrices. We have approached matrices from the, you could say, the right way. So there's no right way, but from a more dynamic, from the perspective of linear functions, they represent linear functions. Every cell, every coordinate has a meaning, and the whole matrix also, how it looks like, has meaning. Okay. 
So you can use that to answer questions about matrices. And obviously, we are using matrices to answer questions about linear functions. And they're seeing some very interesting things. So this is all. This is what it is. Okay. Now the remaining questions which are there, they are there in the previous to previous video. If you don't have it, you have not written it. Okay. So you can see it or you can write it, but try them because they will be now easy. Okay, so try them next time. We will probably just discuss them in a just to go. We'll not discuss them in detail because we'll go to the new thing. So next class when we do matrix, that will be the last class. After that, I will go into determinants because we kind of transition into, into determinants from there. The transition. So yes, so that's a very good book. Okay, uh, but uh, yeah, if you can read that. That's a really good book. Martin is also very good. Sheldon Axler is also very good. Um, but usually they have a lot of definitions, right? Sometimes. So if you cannot see through the definition, then you will get lost because they do, a, because I mean, that, that's a university course, right? So they have to do everything. Uh, yeah. that's it. And also uh, Gilbert Strang also book is very good, but it just depends on the maturity. After some years, you will find that they are very boring books. <laughs> Okay, okay, then okay, 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 okay. I have not read those books really. I've read a little bit, but then I didn't read. I don't end up completing any books, so that was my problem. I mean, when you move forward, you will see there are much better books like this. All the things about these things we are doing using that using matrices this may give you the impression that these things apply only for uh, vectors in r things which are in r3 but even if you look at polynomials of degree three each polynomial can be treated as a vector and they behave in the same way and so the entire theory applies there also not the polynomial function but the, i mean every polynomial itself is like a vector but maybe not see them, maybe a little bit we may see in some polynomial problems. They are very useful. If you look at some Putnam problems, they will you see them applications of linear algebra and Putnam. They will have some commentary, some polynomial questions which they'll do by linear algebra. But mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. So a n is square three is n it square three diverges Mm -hmm. Yeah, so diverges here for everybody just means unbounded, just the sum becomes bigger and bigger. You know. Okay, so you're saying that this can be written, but this is okay, so this can be written as a n square 3. Plus B N uh, one over N square. Oh, no, no, no. no square three numbers. No, no, no. That will not be convergent. That will be. So you want to show what? You want to show that. Diverges. Oh, this is a very simple problem. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Yes, go on. No, no, but see, square. Oh, what am I doing? 
square three doesn't mean that it is not a square. Square three means that it doesn't have no prime factor repeats more than once. Right. But I mean, you are okay. I mean, if you can prove that the numbers which are not squares. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, this question is more than that. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's. But is that easy? That's not. Yeah, that's not easy to prove, right? Yeah. Hmm. This is the first question. Yeah. Okay, then let's think about this. I don't use this simply. Okay. So you see, square three number just means that there are no repetitions. Okay. However, there are no primes. So the numbers which are not squares, they certainly diverge. Right. So I mean, if you take if you take one by k and k is not square. Then this thing, this thing, non-regularly speaking, diverges because those which are squares, they they converge, they add up to, they just converge. That's what we need to know. Like one by n square converges. Summation one by n square converges. We know that. Yeah, yeah, you can do it in many ways. So this is fine, but square-free numbers are a much smaller class. Okay, which don't have any square, so they will be like. So, so square three means that no prime should repeat twice or should repeat more than once i think so yeah that way yeah. so you have primes and then you have the multiples of primes Basically, it will be just a distinct product of distinct primes. Okay. No, but it is not very difficult to. So you see, you see, you can write this like this. Um, yeah. So you can you can just write this series as an, you know, this is not very rigorous, but you can write it as this infinite product. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Okay. Right, right. But this is much easier than that, I think. This is much more easier in, in that sense, but it's also uh, there is a question in the other sense. But anyways, yeah, we, we can show that this way. This is this. Now, um, now how do you show that? Yeah, how do show that this is? Yeah, but this is simple, right? Because this this is bigger than one plus summation one by p. Right. Yeah, but then that's what we want to show. I mean, it, it could just follow. So this would follow from the fact that the summation of one by p is is divergent, right? If, if that is unbounded, then this is surely unbounded. Sorry. Sorry, I lost your voice. Yeah, yeah, 
uh, there is the primes, right? Yeah, so that is unbounded. If I can prove that by an alternate way, then also it's fine, right? And the way to, and uh, yeah, I think I can prove it in an alternate way, maybe, but maybe it's a little. So I don't know, like if you take summation one by P square, this will also be bounded, maybe take summation one by P cube and so on, right? This will also be bounded and then this will also be bounded, right? The, P means prime. If so, if if summation one by P is bounded, if you have this, then you certainly have that these are also bounded, right? And these are not just bounded, but actually you can you can give some good bounds on this, right? So you can actually give some good bounds. Like, so you can you can think about this. Maybe a, a very technical bound is this, but then you can also give some you can also give some bounds so that the product will also that the infinite product will also be bounded. Maybe. Okay. So, then, so you can do that. Then you can multiply all these all these series, and that will give you the harmonic series. Which is unbounded, but there are a lot of gaps to fill. Hmm. Should be more direct. Yes, yes, yeah, that is by square over six. But no, no, but not just yeah, that is there, but also we can maybe use some. Right. Well, I can prove this. I can prove that summation one by three is bound by integration, some technique, log, and so on. Right. So that is that may be too much. Then what is? Yes, but yeah, but that is much more uh, straightforward. Yeah. Yes, right. Right, and this is also so basically this converges to but it's very easy to show log log when it converges to something better, but uh, it is bigger than that is easy to be bigger than this is easy to show log log uh, and or something like that. It's not difficult, some integration and all will do it, but I don't want to, yeah, to also think a little bit. Maybe I'll just think and try and tell you. Tell you over mail or tell you next time Tuesday. Okay, but it should be a much more simpler way. Uh, so I can think now very clearly. <laughs> but I will tell you, I'll try to think about this. Okay. Let me just think out for five minutes now. So I can do it. So I still want to do this. All of us can think.
Yes. One minute, please wait. Yeah, maybe the law of relation. What word? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Right. Yes, so that that is I think easy because if you take so if you take k and then you take two uh, k right and then you take uh, n by k right so see we we know this fundamental result right that and this is just integration you can check it whatever. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, sorry, that's what I was thinking that I was going to say, I was then I meant to this, <laughs> like compare it with this, yeah. So this is basically, you, we all know that this log n is similar to what Ali said, you can check this, alternating the log two, but this is also, this is very important, this is a very, this is better than just saying that the harmonic series diagonals. okay. If that, is, if that is what it is, then, then if you take the numbers like this, which are multiples of k, then obviously you guys can understand that I can take the one by k out, and then I have basically some of reciprocals. Ah, so that is a good thing. Yeah, I would have not thought of this so directly. We have to. Yeah, some thinking I would have got this maybe, but not directly. Now this thing, now now it is easy. Now this thing, this fact, is just n by k. I just take n by k, right? This one to the floor, more or less. Okay. I mean, but n by k is what I'm getting. Yeah, but yeah, you can put it n if you want. If it's less than one by k, time. yeah, you can say that. Yeah, but actually, that doesn't make much difference, right? Log n and log n by k is not so different. Just difference of one. Those which have squares, yes, yes, yes. But that, uh, yeah, I can see it. I can somewhat see what you're saying, but then you have to put. So let me leave this result for homework. Now, from here, it is not difficult, okay? Because when you take a number, it if it has a square, it will have the square of some prime. So this, so see. First, look at this result. Okay. Or maybe first, I mean, if you look at the numbers, uh, so numbers, so the numbers which have squares in them, okay, they will have square of some prime, right? And no, but then yeah, one has to think.
more, but then there will be overlaps, which maybe is not a problem. But what I am directly getting is C from what I am doing. Yeah, right. Like C, they will they will be like, yes, that's the same thing. Even then, there will be overlap. Right. So you are right. Okay. So numbers which are not so. Let's listen to this. Numbers which are not square free, they will have square of some number. So which have so you can just look at numbers which have two square and then which have three squares, three square. So you can basically, I'm saying that you can look at these things. You can look at, you can look at these things. Uh, zero mod four. You can look at this, right? Then you can look at zero mod nine. Yeah, right. And see, there are overlaps, but let's just look at this. Now, this from what we have done, from what we have done, you can take your, you can take your k to be that two square, three square, and so on, right? Yeah. So, and then you can try to see what is happening. Okay. So, we are looking at the numbers which are not square three first. Okay. So, we, so we're not really comparing it. So comparing this directly like that because this city is primes and all. So let me just I mean okay I don't know that yes maybe we can do that. Yeah maybe 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 all of us can try that but I'll just leave it here. I'll just clarify what I've said so far and leave it because from here it will be simple. The idea is to look at look at uh numbers which are not square three okay numbers look at numbers because the idea is a moment importantly are numbers with squares so that roughly means so there are intersections okay but that roughly means looking at these numbers which have zero mod k zero mod four sorry and then basically the four k four eight and so on multiples of four and then you will look at multiples of eight but not eight um just just look at the basic just look at squares of primes maybe that, that's good enough but you can see you can just take square numbers then that yeah so then you can look at nine and so on and now you use maybe i should not say k here that can be confusing but there's already three used in a different way now you see these are all like four k's like these are like four two times four two times four so you can use this result okay up till up till something up till some, some n right if you use this result you will get that this is less than ln n times one by k and now the k is one by four plus one by nine plus one by and so on so if these numbers are less than this then the complement is bigger than what you have to think. You have to use that totally ln n and from there you will get less. Just work out the details, okay? It will not be difficult. Now I said Raghav said some telescoping and all, but I think just try to do this directly because if you don't something, you will need the telescoping thing. Let's try it. Let us see. Right. Okay, but either way, either way, this thing is bounded. We know it's less than five square. Less. You can use that. It's bounded. You can just use some m. You don't need. Just don't want to show that the other one diverges. Right? So you just want to show this is convergent or something. Convergent in the sense that this thing is want to go to bound. This thing you can just again use the integration thing. But this is again less than one by one square. No, no, no. You do not. Yes, yes, but see, this is a tricky exercise in that sense, right? Because we are already using this result, okay? That this is ln n. Now, this does not need integration. So try to prove this. This is the key result, right? Prove without integration is not difficult. Yes, you can prove this without integration. Yeah, so you have to. Yeah. 
No, but see, the, yeah, those are the details which are left to work out. So, try it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The, that can be worked out. The point is that this thing, which you don't want to use integration, then you can just uh, you can just use a comparison technique, right? Just group in the powers of twos, and you can compare. So one by three plus one by four is bigger than one by two. Then one by five to one by eight to bigger than one by four. So you see, you get powers of twos, and you can understand you know, how log comes out. So two to the power k log is two is k. So try to do this just by squeezing and yeah, squeezing and comparing. You can do it. But integration is the more natural way because the graph and area is much better, and also the error is much very small. To so do this. So diverging for positive series, which is mostly what is there in your syllabus, will mean going to infinite. Okay, but no, then it doesn't mean no. so divergence doesn't mean going to infinite always. Okay, divergence means not convergent. Okay, I mean okay, but some books are like divergent means going to infinite, convergent means converging, and not and oscillating means the complement of all those two. All the two. Okay. But uh, what divergent should mean is not converging in the more mature sense. Not con now, not converging means what? Because when you take a series S, it's basically a sequence of these partial sums. Very good. Right? Sequence of these partial sums, right? And when we say that S is divergent, we just mean that the sequence of partial sums, the sequence, now this is a sequence. So you have brought it down to language of sequences. The sequence is not perfect. That's what divergent means. But mostly when we are doing is like positive series, so we are okay. Because already we are doing a lot of uh, non regress things in what they've done, which you know, maybe you don't see now, but we leave that. Okay. But this is what it means. So with this definition, you can rigorously prove that one minus one and that thing doesn't converge because the partials are uh, there. Sequence of partial summation is less than Okay. Right. Okay. So we ended up having a very long class. I'll stop now. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Yes, actually, I told you, yeah, actually, I was talking with Chandran that I will discuss. Yeah, but then I didn't discuss. So I will just do that on Tuesday. So Tuesday, we will discuss that because all of us wrote it, right? So Tuesday, we will do that only. We will not do analysis class. We will do this like that. We will discuss the whole paper in that. We will discuss the main ideas and try to see. Okay. I mean, I will not rush, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It was a fairly long class. Thank you. Um, yeah. And also, um, 